More than 150 writers, activists and academics have signed an open letter saying freedom of speech is under threat in North America. Is it not strange that if you want to have a debate about a central cultural issue, you've got to be cautious? So-called cancel culture is spreading across the country, destroying reputations and ruining lives of those who misspeak, like the wrong tweets, and simply hold views that some deem politically incorrect. But is cancel culture in Canada gone too far? And is the small but powerful mob in their relentless pursuit for moral conformity at odds with Canadian values of free speech and free expression? It's a secular doctrine. Hard left politics is a doctrine as much as any dogma of any church. When everybody thinks alike, nobody thinks very much. Let's have a frank and honest conversation. My name is Aaron Gunn, and this is Politics Explained. You know, I was talking to a veteran. I said, I'm not going to run the poppy thing anymore because what's the sense? For over 30 years, Don Cherry was a Canadian cultural icon and co-host of Hockey Night in Canada's Coach's Corner. Known for his outspoken manner, flamboyant dress and support for Canada's troops, he was, at one point, even voted the seventh greatest Canadian of all time. Then, on November 9, 2019, everything would change. I live in Mississauga, nobody wears uh, uh, very few people wear uh, a poppy. Now you go to the small cities, and you know you, you know those the rows on rows. You people love you. you they come here, whatever it is. You love our way of life. You love our milk and honey. At least you could pay a couple of bucks for poppies or something like that. Don Cherry is facing backlash after appearing to target immigrants. He needs to sit down and stop talking. The president of Sportsnet, Cherry's employer, called these most recent words discriminatory and offensive. But he won't take back his comments about new Canadians or you people. Although the segment received little attention at first, following an internet and Twitter outcry, Roger Sportsnet would capitulate, firing Cherry two days later on Monday, November 11th, Remembrance Day. It is probably the highest profile example of cancel culture at work here in Canada, but it is certainly not alone. Jessica Mulrooney, TV host and fashion stylist, cancelled for a dispute involving the veracity of her racial advocacy in Toronto. Michael Kornberg, head of UBC's Board of Governors, cancelled for liking conservative content on his own personal Twitter. And Stockwell Day, a former cabinet minister and leader of the opposition, cancelled for suggesting, among other things, that Canada was not a racist country. No, I'm saying most Canadians, in fact, are not racist. But I don't know that for a fact. Well, I know that for a fact because I, I have, I, I know Canadians, I know friends. These are just a handful of the numerous career assassinations carried out by a marauding group of online activists. Activists who are bent on viciously pursuing anyone who strays away from what they see as the only iteration of true ideological purity. And maybe no other Canadian has been in the crosshairs of these cancel culture warriors more than longtime political commentator and unrepentant critic of political correctness, Rex Murphy. Suddenly now, if you have an opinion, even if it's a, a wisp of opinion, and a certain crowd, hard left usually, doesn't want to hear it, then you become a racist, a villain, or one of the great catalog of phobes that they have manufactured. Is it, it appears to me that it's almost like this new, and it's in the media, and like you said, it normally comes from the hard left, it's almost like a new religion. It is a religion. Uh, it's a way of morally distinguishing. It's a shallow religion, it's a false religion, it's a fraud religion. But the mentality behind it is, if I have this view on X or Y, this is the sacred view. This one came down from the mount that was inscribed on the tablets. Now you, you poor fool, uh, you've been thinking about it for yourself. And your opinion is different from mine, but I'm the virtuous person. And you, you're the absurd, uh, malignant clown that has a different view than me. So you gotta be stopped. It's almost like an interior censor border, Stalinism abstracted. There's no army or no secret service or KGB coming to get you, but where is Twitter? But it's not just the online mob from which Canadians need to be concerned. 
in Canada, legal protections for free speech and free expression are much less absolute than our neighbors to the south, with governments allowed to pass laws that control and prohibit certain speech, most alarmingly, through the quasi-judicial courts, often referred to as human rights tribunals. One individual who's had more than his fair share of run-ins with these commissions is Canadian rabble-rouser, media personality, and founder of Rebel News, Ezra Levant. The human rights tribunals, can you explain exactly what they are? Well, across Canada, human rights commissions started to be created in the 60s and 70s. And this was part of the civil rights movement. So they were created in good faith, I believe, to help people who were falling through the cracks. But you know what? In the last 40, 50 years, Canada has changed a lot. So what you have is an activist body with a budget and staff looking for a purpose. These human rights tribunals justify their existence by going after businesses and individuals for infractions imagined or otherwise brought to their attention through a complaint-based system. In 2006, Levant in his paper for which he was publisher at the time, the Western Standard, was subject to one of these complaints for republishing cartoons of the Muslim prophet Muhammad in a show of free speech solidarity with publications around the world. These controversial cartoons, which had been originally published in a Danish newspaper, had caused consternation among Muslims who find the drawings of their prophet offensive regardless of context. I thought, well, Fort 90, there's no way we're going to hit this story hard. The, the daily newspapers are going to get it better. First, McLean's Magazine, which was then edited by Ken White. Oh, they're going to do it. The Calgary Sun, Toronto Sun, the tabloids are going to take it. Oh, well, let's do a thoughtful piece, you know, in retrospect, because everyone's going to beat us to it. Well, guess what? It's two days to publication date, and we realize we're the only people in the country publishing these cartoons. <laughs> But Levant's publication of these cartoons was met with complaints filed to the Alberta Human Rights and Citizenship Commission, notably from the Islamic Supreme Council of Canada. And I got this letter from the Human Rights Commission. I thought it was a joke. So I wrote back, well, freedom of speech, go away. Well, that was the beginning of a 900-day investigation of me. They were dead serious. But they actually came at me for 900 days. I, I think we spent 100 grand in legal fees on that. In 2008, Levant was finally interrogated by the Human Rights Commission over his publication of these cartoons. He and his legal team decided to videotape the interrogation and post it on the internet. There was only one question I prepared for in my mind in advance. I had done a hundred media interviews, a hundred, around the world for why I published them. And I had my pat answers for reports. Why did you publish them? They were the central artifact of the news story of the season, that's why. Why didn't you publish them? Like, I, I had my set answers, but it had to be a different answer for when the government asked me. My name is Ezra Levant. Before this government interrogation begins, I will make a statement. When the Western Standard magazine printed the Danish cartoons of Mohammed two years ago, I was the publisher. It was the proudest moment of my public life. The only answer any self-respecting citizen can, be, can give is, because it's my right to do so, and nothing more is your business. It is my position that the government has no legal or moral authority to interrogate me or anyone else for publishing these words and pictures. That is a violation of my ancient and inalienable freedoms, freedom of speech, freedom of the press, and in this case, religious freedom and the separation of mosque and state. I can offend as much as I want. I'm taking up my maximum freedom and I insist you find me guilty because I am not trying to moderate or haggle or compromise for my freedom. So she was sort of startled that I wasn't coming in to try and be reasonable. The opposite, I had to say, I demand the right to be a blasphemer. How ironic that something that calls itself the Human Rights Commission is the one corroding those rights. Entitled to your opinions. In the end, the complaint was eventually withdrawn, but not before Levent was forced to pay an estimated $100,000 in legal fees out of his own pocket, in a process that dragged out nearly three years. And these human rights tribunals are only getting more powerful. In fact, a new law, Bill C-16, passed by the Trudeau government, 
raises the very real possibility they may actually start compelling speech from Canadians under certain circumstances. C-16 was an amendment to the Canadian Human Rights Act. This amendment added a gender expression and identity to the grounds upon which you're not allowed to discriminate. It was this issue and this debate that first propelled University of Toronto professor Jordan Peterson to national and international prominence back in 2016. Uh, look, I think that's what's happening is that we're pushing over a line we shouldn't cross. The newest legislation is requiring people to use... But you are aware that that's being put... In and Jordan's point was, this is going to be interpreted to require you to use the gender neutral pronouns that people come up and demand of you. I'm not against the idea of pronouns or, or transgenderism or anything of that. I'm against being compelled to speak by other people and the government. That was, the, that was basically the argument that, that, that he made and that I made and that others made. Since then, a long list of online and other activists have attempted to cancel and silence Peterson as a consequence for his views. Instead, their efforts, ironically, simply added to his fame and the power of his movement. Why should your right to freedom of speech trump a trans person's right not to be offended? Because in order to be able to think, you have to risk being offensive. You know, like you're certainly willing to risk offending me in the pursuit of truth. Why should you have the right to do that? It's been rather uncomfortable. He is the most effective communicator on this issue, so they would definitely try and cancel him. It does do, in fact, what, what Jordan was saying, which is it compels speech. And that's a very bad road to be going down, I think, in this country. Not content with being unable to cancel and silence Jordan Peterson, activists turn next to those who propagated or simply confessed an openness to debating and listening to his views. See, the Lindsay Shepard uh, problem that you mentioned is an interesting case example of this, right? At, at Wilfrid Laurier, she was a teaching assistant, and for her class, she showed a clip uh, from TV Ontario of Jordan Peterson and another fellow uh, basically debating the idea of whether or not you have to use the pronouns that somebody says you have to use. And she was basically, well, I'm going to use the word strung up. She was called in to a meeting with her supervisor and so on, saying that was not a proper thing to do because, you know, uh, you know Jordan Peterson, for God's sake, how could you show a, a clip of Jordan Peterson? Um, I knew that when I was called into that meeting, uh, I knew something was really wrong. So I understand the position that you're coming from and your positionality, but the reality is that it has created a, to a, a toxic climate for some of the students. It, you know, it's, how many? it's great that... Ooh, like how many? Okay. One? So I was told there were one or more complaints. I, I asked multiple times in the meeting, can I please see the complaint? I assumed it was written somewhere and I was told no. When you're bringing it into the context of the classroom, that can become problematic. And that can become something that is, that creates an unsafe learning environment for students. You know, if I hadn't secretly recorded the meeting and gone to the media, I probably would have never known um, that those complaints didn't exist. In a university, all perspectives are valid. That's not necessarily true. In after Shepard released the recordings, an investigator hired by the university determined the disciplinary meeting with her should have never taken place, that no formal complaint or concern had even been registered, and that, quite simply, she had done nothing wrong. But stories like Shepard's are not isolated incidents. Over the years, Canadian universities have been transformed from bastions of free speech and free expression to the institutions where those very same values go to die, where loud, vocal minorities bully school administrators and their fellow students into deplatforming speakers and repressing opposing points of view, which is exactly what happened to me in March of 2020 when the University of Victoria cancelled an event at which I was slated to speak. Caving to the demands and threats of totalitarian left-wing activists, and in doing so, stifling the free exchange of ideas on which the very concept of higher education was purposefully built. 
to talk further about the threats facing free speech on campuses, I met with the president of Canada's Justice Centre for Constitutional Freedoms, John Carpe. How did we get here with universities? They used to be kind of the guarantors of free speech and free expression, and now they've basically become a force for illiberalism and, and basically stifling these exact same freedoms. How did that, how did we get here? It happened gradually, but when there's uh, mob censorship, when there's people that are pulling a fire alarms, physical obstruction, shouting, screaming, doing these different things to actually shut down events, those students need to be disciplined uh, under the code of conduct and where warranted, they should be expelled from the university. Because if you're a thug, if you're basically a fascist that's going to shut down somebody else's free speech, uh, you don't deserve to be a, a university and you have no business being there. And when these institutions egregiously infringe on the rights of their students, as has happened many times before, the JCCF challenges these actions in a court of law. The university has a legal obligation to uphold its own mission statement and its own policies. And so it's illegal for a university to violate its own policies and to give in to uh, this kind of intimidation and, and bullying and mob censorship as what UBC has done uh, in regards to the Free Speech Club. For years, the Free Speech Club, made up primarily of UBC students and alumni, have held events at the university promoting debate and discussion on a variety of topics while hosting speakers on both the left and the right of the political spectrum. Events that often drew crowds in the hundreds, but which were always carried out safely and without much consternation. That is, until the winter of 2019. So I said, look, I want to bring this guy. Um, he's a journalist, he's, he's right of center, he focuses on radicalism and, and violence. The speaker was to be Andy Ngo, who is a journalist who has covered the Antifa, which is a violent left-wing radical group. So we booked Andy, started selling tickets, started advertising, he was advertising it. And it was in December that I got a few voicemails that I missed from the chief risk officer of UBC. And in my head, before I even listen to it, I think, okay, here we go, they're gonna say we need to pay 20 grand in security. I've done this, I've, I've crossed this bridge before. That wasn't what it was. He said, look, um, security isn't even an option. You can't appeal it. We are basically informing you after the fact that the executive made a decision to cancel the event. I was obviously shocked, and I said, what's going on? And he said, look, things have gotten more violent on campus. Uh, the school is having trouble dealing with Antifa. UBC is allowing Antifa to dictate who gets to speak on campus and who does not. It's not like it's a private venue that could say, ah, you know what, I don't want to do the contract with you. This is a publicly funded, you know, taxpayer university. What does it mean when they have the wherewithal to just make the decision not to allow certain people to have their freedom? So, should the rise of cancel culture and erosion of free speech concern everyday Canadians? Well, yes. From deplatforming universities to the interrogation of journalists, the stifling of free speech and free expression is a direct assault on the very core values that underpin our society. The right to freely exchange ideas isn't just some privilege that can be easily discarded. It forms part of the very democratic ethos on which Canada and indeed Western civilization is built. That doesn't mean you have to agree with everything everyone always says. It just means you should respect their right and their freedom to say it. How many people's careers have been collapsed because some, 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 some crowd of anonymous mob well, the first thing is it works. So if it works, you'll get more of it. And how can we advance our own thinking and advance our own ideas and, and kind of refine them when we have no one to bounce ideas off of because we're so scared? It's, it's, a, it's, it's the most backward intellectual and social and political phenomenon that I have seen. But at the end of the day, I think the only way to prevent, you know, the downfall of society is if we all collectively come together and say enough. Until next time, my name is Aaron Gunn, and this has been Politics Explained.